Notes to start. Don't forget to take a look at our new channel, Visual Academy. The population was besieged by the Mongolian army of the Golden Horde. Some of the soldiers among the Asian troops were already sick. I'll leave you the link in the description. So let's get started. When we talk about large armed forces and armies, we usually focus on cases such as the United States, China or Russia. Beyond that, it's a stretch to come up with more contenders, perhaps those of the United Kingdom or France. And those countries barely feature in the struggle for power and hegemony in the 21st century. But what about India? After all, India is the second most populous country in the world, and very soon, if it is not already, it will be the first. And it's not just about population. By area, it is also among the 10 largest countries in the world. Specifically, it ranks seventh. Moreover, in one way or another, its economy is booming. Or so many investors hope, and more and more companies are setting up production plants there. Tesla to set up electric car manufacturing unit in southern India, Reuters. Apple ramps up iPhone and iPad output shift to India and Vietnam, Nikkei, Asia. And keep in mind, because we tend to forget about it, but when we talk about India, we are also talking about one of the nine nuclear powers in the world today. Although there is no official confirmed data, its arsenal is estimated at around 150 nuclear warheads. And yes, although it is often overlooked, India also has its own geopolitical clashes and disputes, including its own clash with the great Asian giant, the People's Republic of China. You see, the two countries that India has the most problematic relationship with today are Pakistan and China. The main focus of the conflict is in the region of Kashmir, a region shared between Pakistan and India, with a small part also in the hands of the Chinese giant. So in this area, India keeps two flanks open. On the one hand, against Pakistan, which New Delhi accuses of sending militia men across the provisional border to destabilize the Indian part of Kashmir, and on the other hand, against China, with whom it shares a border in the Galwan Valley that, from time to time, becomes the scene of armed clashes and tensions. Likewise, India and China, as we have already told you on Visual Politic, share an unfriendly mountainous border in the Himalayas and also have conflicting interests in the Indian Ocean. An ocean where we find an increasingly expansionist China that tries to take control of the area by building naval bases, while India seeks to strengthen its navy to ensure its trade routes. However, despite being a demographic giant, a rising power in the making, and having two conflicts with two nuclear powers, India, the world's leader in bureaucracy, far from having developed a powerful and fearsome army, as we might expect, has an armed forces riddled with problems. That is not the only issue. In the areas under dispute with its neighbors, the country also lacks good overland infrastructure, such as roads and railroads, which greatly hampers supply chains and the potential deployment of troops in the event of a conflict. However, all this could soon change. So what role does India really play in the new power struggle that is developing in the Asia-Pacific region? How does New Delhi hope to compete with its northern neighbor? Are we perhaps witnessing the beginnings of a new kind of Cold War between China and India? Listen up. When size does not matter. Unlike China, Russia, and other major emerging military powers, India never had a deeply rooted military tradition. When the country ceased to be a British colony in 1947, the British left behind no established military culture and no strong internal security or intelligence structures. In fact, the situation did not change much after independence was achieved. Successive Indian governments considered the lack of economic and social development to be a greater threat than any posed by the country's neighbors. And of course, if we're talking about a poor and densely populated country, you can imagine the makeup of its armed forces. Traditionally, the Indian Army has always been very dependent on the number of troops, leaving the issue of equipment modernization in second or third place. Therefore, although India has the third largest military budget in the world, after China and the United States, its operational capabilities in practice are very limited. You could say that the configuration of the Indian Army is more reminiscent of the armies of the first half of the 20th century than of modern armed forces. <laughs> 
Now, let me explain. India's armed forces are currently composed of 1.5 million troops. According to analysts and military strategists, they need to get rid of at least 200,000 to 300,000 men and divert the surplus resources to improving battlefield weaponry. For example, investing in modern artillery, light attack helicopters, and fourth and fifth generation air capabilities. Then, in addition to overstaffing and shortages of equipment and weaponry, there is also the problem of military pensions. To give you an idea, almost 30% of the defense budget for 2021 goes to paying military pensions. That's almost $18 billion out of a total budget of about $62 billion. In other words, the Indian Army practically spends more on military pensions than on the acquisition of new equipment. In fact, if we subtract military pensions from the budget, then India's position in the ranking of countries by military spending falls from third place to ninth, and is on par with countries like South Korea. But of course, with almost 1.5 million soldiers to pay, train, prepare, and equip. Yet, these are not the only problems facing the Indian Armed Forces. The country has also had serious problems in trying to achieve the goal of developing a strong military industry of its own. And this is precisely one of the missions that the current government has set for itself. Obviously, having a strong military industry allows a country to be much less dependent on the international geopolitical situation when it comes to buying military equipment. And that also makes you less vulnerable. If you depend exclusively on purchases in the international market, and especially if you are overly dependent on one country and suddenly a conflict occurs, you can't get involved without risking what would happen to military supplies. Now, this is the current situation in India, but what are they doing about it? What are New Delhi's plans? Well, let's take a look. Building an armed force from scratch? For some years now, the Indian government has been focusing on the weaknesses of its armed forces. You could say that they seem to have realized that they are neither efficient nor modern, nor would they be up to the task in case things go wrong with China or even Pakistan. That explains why a 15-year modernization and restructuring program was launched in 2012, due for completion in 2027. We are talking about the Long-Term Integrated Perspective Plan, or LTIP. It's a plan that anticipates the purchase of $250 billion worth of modern weaponry during that period, but which has nevertheless less been suffering cuts and constant delays over the years. Even so, although not all the deadlines and goals set so far have been met, there has been some improvement in Indian military capabilities by sea, land and air. Let's take a look at these improvements, starting with the Navy. India aims to have a force of 200 warships and 500 combat aircraft operational by 2050, which would make it one of the strongest navies in the world. However, at present, it only has about 170 ships, 17 submarines, and just over 200 naval aircraft. They are, therefore, still far short of their goal. Amidst its current equipment, it has one aircraft carrier, the INS Vikramaditya, which is a Soviet aircraft carrier purchased from Russia in 2004. It is also developing native aircraft carriers with the aim to incorporate two or more vessels before the end of the next decade. Just out of interest, approximately 60% of current Indian military equipment is of Soviet or Russian origin, particularly submarines, aircraft, and armored vehicles. But back to the Navy. In addition to the aircraft carrier, it also has 11 destroyers, 13 frigates, 23 corvettes, 7 reconnaissance ships, 15 conventional submarines, 1 nuclear submarine, and a ballistic missile submarine, as well as other smaller vessels. Well, this is the current inventory, but the question is, what is to come? In addition to the two new aircraft carriers mentioned before, the plans for the Navy include 24 new submarines, including six nuclear-powered and six diesel-electric submarines with advanced air-independent propulsion systems, which will allow them to stay underwater for longer. They will also acquire seven new frigates and five support vessels, among other minor acquisitions. But perhaps the real news comes when talking about what is expected to be added to the Army and Air Force. You see, the modernization of the Indian Army involves the incorporation of 464 Russian T-90 tanks, in addition to the 2,000 tanks already in service. The aim is to operate some 3,000 Russian tanks of this type and to have them replace the older tanks, such as the Soviet T-72s that are still in service. But it's not just tanks. Improvements are also coming in the field of artillery with the development of long-range artillery guns and greater mobility that will allow Indian weapons to reach targets on the border with Pakistan from greater distances. For example, up to 145 M777A2 howitzers will be procured from the United States, a total of 100 South Korean K9 self-propelled howitzers and native ATACS, ATAGS howitzers are also being developed. 
then to protect military and nuclear bases, along with cities and strategic infrastructure. India signed an agreement with Russia in 2016 to deploy the Russian S-400 anti-aircraft defense system, one of the best anti-aircraft systems in the world. The adoption of the S-400 could give India a decisive advantage over Pakistan, making it practically impossible for any Pakistani plane, drone, helicopter or missile to attack Indian territory. We're talking about a deployment that, yes, has not sat well at all with the United States, a country allied with India, which even threatened sanctions for a 2017 law that punishes the purchase of this type of Russian equipment. India's friction with the United States rises over planned purchase of Russian S-400 defense systems. New Delhi did not have a wide waiver from a 2017 US law aimed at deterring countries from buying Russian military hardware, CNBC. In addition, in 2017, India signed a $2 billion contract with Israel to equip the Indian army with a regiment of 16 launchers and 560 Israeli Barak 8 missiles. Oh, and they will also add 22 US Apache attack helicopters, which are considered one of the most lethal machines in the world. And after reviewing the changes in the Navy and the land forces, it is now time to turn to the Air Force. Friends, although India is the fourth largest air force in the world after the United States, Russia and China, it is not exactly the most cutting edge. It currently has 806 fighters, 82 special mission aircraft, 7 refueling aircraft, 232 transport aircraft, 652 helicopters and 325 training aircraft. And if that already sounds like a lot, the IAF, the Indian Air Force, intends to add more than 400 additional aircraft. To this end, the IAF has just added 53 new Sukhoi Su-30s to its fleet, so that it now flies 272 aircraft of this Russian model. It has also signed a nearly $9 billion contract with France for the purchase of 36 Dassault Rafale fighters. These two models are capable of carrying different types of missiles, including nuclear-capable missiles such as the Indo-Russian BrahMos. <laughs> In addition to the fighters, there are also new early warning and airborne control systems, as well as a new satellite network that India already has in operation. We are talking about satellites such as the RISAT-2, and a kind of lookout satellite specially designed to monitor Pakistan 24 hours a day. And this long list that we have described only covers the most significant programs, but I think the idea is clear. It seems that India is getting down to work on a major modernization of its armed forces. The country wants to stop being a paper tiger and become a feared and fierce fire tiger, but it's going to take a lot of money to complete its plan. And for the time being, the truth is that India has not put much money into its defense programs in recent years. And that means that many of these plans are being developed in more of a piecemeal fashion than as an integrated program to improve operational capabilities. For example, between 2000 and 2019, India's defense spending relative to its GDP fell from 2.45% to 1.49%. And although it has now rebounded slightly to 2.18%, if we compare it with China's approximately 2% and taking into account that China's GDP is five times larger than India's, we can see the significant gap between the two countries. For their part, many defense analysts say that India's 15-year plan, which expires in 2027, lacks strategic sense. That is, some of the arms acquisitions may not be well targeted to actual needs in the event of war. Of course, perhaps India's great strength, its great bet, is the deterrent capability of its 150 nuclear warheads. But that does not mean that it is questionable that, despite having an annual expenditure of more than $60 billion, the country can barely aspire to play any regional role. Will India manage to change the situation and see its budding desires to become a powerhouse fulfilled? We can see that for the time being, as you can see, the modernization plans continue to advance, albeit slowly. Local production is not taking off either. The government has signed co-production and co-development agreements with the United States, Israel and Russia through the Make in India scheme, but it does not seem to be enough. Not to mention the bureaucratic hell that is India and how that affects production chains. In any case, only time will tell what the outlook will be in a few years time. The wish lists are on the table, along with all the shortcomings and difficulties as well. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. Best regards, and see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.